Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me have attention, please. I'll quiet, please. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and start a new section <clears throat> in your um, notes. This will be for the last part of the Cold War, what we call Cold War Part 3 of 3. Basically, this is going to take us from 1977 with the presidency of Jimmy Carter as the leader of the free world, the United States. And um, at the same time, let me see, who do we have in charge of in the Soviet Union at, the, at that time? Brezhnev, yep, it's going to be Brezhnev. He'll be like, he'll be starting to kind of peter out. When we get Brezhnev, then we'll get a couple of others, and then we'll end up. And you guys remember the name of the last Soviet leader. He's going to take us all the way up until literally 1991. Gorbachev, that's right, Mikhail Gorbachev. So, <clears throat> I'm talking, I'm, t I'm instructing, please. Um, so this unit, going up through 1991, is going to take us to the end of the Cold War. So it's a big, big deal. We'll go through Jimmy Carter, uh, President number 39. We'll get into Reagan. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the presidency of Ronald Reagan in this particular unit. And then it will wrap up during the time of the four-year presidency of George H.W. Bush. Okay? And um, on this one, because... I mean, it's Cold War, but we're also doing the things that take place during that time period. So we'll see, this unit will actually wrap up with three wars that are quite interesting. One of them is really kind of curious, between Britain and Argentina over a bunch of islands off the coast of Argentina. Depending on who you talk to, it's either called the Falklands War or the Malvinas War. Okay? And then we'll get into a couple of wars that are going to have a little bit more impact in the that will lead to more understanding of what's going on like currently in the Middle East. We'll have the Iran-Iraq War and then the Persian Gulf War of 1991, which will be followed. We'll give you context because later we'll be involved in another war uh, where Iraq is on the other side and in that war we will overthrow Saddam Hussein and we'll get into all the interesting implications there. Yeah. We did. We did. I believe if you weren't here, then you probably were the only one that didn't get that. Okay? And you want to have that out in front of you. If you look at there, you can see, as I mentioned, there's a lot of Cold War kind of stuff. So chronologically, Cold War, Cold War, Cold War. But since it overlaps with um, Paper 2 topic, um, 20th century wars, we've actually got four of those 20th century wars. And one of them is a, is a Cold War war. That is the Nicaraguan Revolution and Civil War. We're going to get into that today. Okay? And then we'll get into the last three wars. We'll do that kind of toward the tail end of that. Okay? Um, and then for your information after that, there's only one more unit. After we finish this one, there's only one more unit. And that covers like genocidal situations in the Balkans and Rwanda. Yeah. Yeah, genocide. Exactly. Uh, where things are just crazy, crazy, crazy. I mean, I, it's weird because I'm about to start like uh, the 11th grade uh, unit on everything that took place before World War II, how democracy got crushed, didn't even have an opportunity really to take, get started in Russia, how democracy will be in existence in Spain and Italy and Germany and get taken away. <laughs> A democracy will never really get a chance to get going uh, in Japan or China. It's like, wow, all those really depressing times when democracy was under threat. I mean, like that's ever going to happen in this country. I was disappointed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to object to things and so forth, have a peaceful rally. And there were lots of peaceful rallies in lots of different parts across the country. I mean, there was one in front of the state house. I mean, that's fine, you know. Have a peaceful rally. I was very disappointed at how it turned out in Washington, D.C. I mean, because when I was your age, I was, <laughs> I was wandering around the Capitol building as a page. I did not do any destruction to any of the property or invade any of the offices. If I went into an office, it was to harass them so that I could, they could give me an autographed photograph of a senator or to deliver a message. <laughs> I was a page. I mean, it was cool. And, and actually, it's kind of sad because if you go back to Washington, <clears throat> the Capitol building, over the last 20, 25 years, actually since 9-11, it's more secure, right? I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, it has to be. But obviously, yesterday, it wasn't secure enough because people who were really kind of riled up, and they're already kind of riled up to begin with, and I think they got a little bit more riled up, they broke into the building. That was, like, completely not okay. So I've been actually following the news. Um, if you follow it, um, I mean, I was doing my three afternoon classes, sixth period, seventh period, and I was walking in the hall between seventh and eighth. <laughs> Somebody was like, I am I'm, I'm astonished at what is happening in Washington. I'm like, I don't know what's going on in Washington. So at the end of eighth period, I was like doing what I always do. When there's stuff going on in the news, I was following it very carefully. And I didn't stay up until, like, they finally did finish the certification or the reception process, really, of the votes that had been certified in the Electoral College. And so that process was finished really, really late last night because Congress got their job done. Does anyone not know what I'm talking about? Okay, good. I mean, so yesterday in Washington, D.C., um, a bunch of people broke into the Capitol building. They had previously been attending a rally that had a number of speakers, including President Trump. That was like near the White House, not too far from the White House. And then they were encouraged to and did march up to the Capitol building, and they broke in. Yeah. Actually, one woman was shot, and she's dead now. Apparently, there's three other people that are dead as a result of things. I don't know all the details there. But it was bad. I mean, members of Congress went into security. They had to bring in, like, extra law enforcement because the Capitol Police was not enough to handle those crowds and what they were doing. And, um, yeah, eventually they got them out, and then they finished the job. And there were, you know, objections of this, that, and so forth. But, I mean, it is what it is. In a democracy, I mean, if I were to, like, color these presidents and so forth and kind of, like, have red for one, you know, the Republicans and maybe blue for the others, you'd see that democracy can be, <laughs> and typically is, disappointing in the fact that the people who you want and the policies you want don't always come to play. But we are competitive. And in a democracy, if you win, ha-ha, but you still have responsibility because guess what comes after you win an election? Yeah, you got the next election and the process in between, which is everyone gets involved and voices their opinions and yada, yada, yada. And, but it comes and goes and comes and goes. Unlike what we covered last year in 11th grade, and actually we're going to be covering it as well in some of these other countries, um, <clears throat> where you get, like, the military involved and you get, like, you know, crowds involved and you get mobs involved and things like that. We don't do that. So it was a real disappointment that that was taking place. Um, but on the, the plus side, there were a lot of people who had supported, um, for example, President Trump's reelection effort, but they were like, mm, this is not okay. What took place yesterday is absolutely not okay. In fact, so I've been following some of the news right before you guys came in. Um, there's some discussion as to, like, will President Trump be <laughs> the president over the next two weeks? I mean, he's got 13 days left. There's some concern. I mean, he's already kicked off of Twitter. I mean, you know, and Facebook has kicked him off. Yeah, and Facebook has kicked him off indefinitely. Um, and so, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. And it, it almost sounds like, because somebody was bringing up the question, it's like, well, the National Guard was finally called in by... Vice President Pence, I'm like, Vice President? The Vice President doesn't have the authority over that. But it seems like what they were referring to almost as like a soft 25th Amendment in the White House right now. I mean, staffers and cabinet members are almost like ignoring the President and just like acting on what they believe is best for the country. So there's a lot to go through, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity over the coming days to kind of work that through. Um, but needless to say, yeah. I was, yeah. Anybody have any questions or comments about that? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like, it's really disappointing because, I mean, if you agree with policies and so forth that were advanced by President Trump or you were, you were pleased with, like, his court appointments and policies that he imp implemented over the last four years and so forth, it's really disappointing. But, I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know, have you ever played a game with somebody that you, like, really enjoyed their company and then you played a game with them and then they were a total brat when they lost? Are you that person? Is that your sister? I mean, it's like, how, do you, how are you going to raise your kids so that they can handle losing? Are you always going to let them win? Because be careful, because if you always let them win, when they finally lose, they might just, like, you know, blow a gasket. Losing is part of life, dude. I mean, 
That's why I always like it when, like, you know, I hear about North Star teams and, you know, they win, like, you know, best sportsmanship awards and so forth. It's also cool when they win games, you know, you know, I'm going to take that away. But, I mean, that sportsmanship part is, like, that's, that's, that's core, man. You know, the other team might have better players or better luck that day and so forth, but if we got better people <laughs> on our team, I mean, that's good. So, if you lose, you got to deal with it. I remember when my dad lost. It sucked. We were really upset. And we grabbed pitchforks and we, just kidding, we did not grab pitchforks. And, and no, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my brother right here, Jim Hansen, when he ran for Congress, he was blown out of the water. He ran as a Democrat in Idaho for the second congressional district. You know, that's, that's a reach. I mean, my dad won it as a Republican, although Jim yesterday took a, the oath of office for Ada County Highway District because he was reelected to that. And so he's one of the, um, the highway district people here in Ada County. What's that? You, do you need to get in contact with him about a pothole or something? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll give you his number. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. It was like when we got this big snow during Snowmageddon. Do you guys remember that? I'm like, Jim, I'm going to send you the bill. I have to shovel all the snow off the road in front of my house. And anyway, whatever. So, yeah, those are some of the responsibilities of local government officials, including what he does. I know, yeah. I mean, he's actually he's a commissioner that oversees the commission and all the regular full-time employees and so forth there. So here's the deal. Um, uh, as I mentioned to you, um, we did the test. Okay, we got uh, one person here in the room that's going to be taking the test later. Um, but um, as far as uh, points, um, there's opportunities. We've got a whole bunch of things that people have done already as far as picking up additional points for quizzes and tests that we've done before, since we do still have, what, two weeks left in the, in the semester, I'll create an opportunity for you guys to pick up some additional points relative to this test. I think I'll probably take, you know, one or, one or two of the essays um, that other people are going to be writing, and you can write those to get some additional points. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, hello, they're doozy. And you've got two more of those. One for this unit we're on, right, going to be starting right now. And then we'll have a test that will combine Rwanda and the Balkans. And then after we do that, it's prep time. So like April is going to be like calibration time. You'll be doing lots and lots of essays in here to just get better and better and better at writing Ivy history essays because y'all are signed up for the, the test in May. And then, Jackson, what are we going to do after May 5th in here? We're going to watch movies. We're going to go to Disney World. Yeah, woohoo! Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> we're not going to go to Disney World, but I mean, yeah. Uh, you need to talk to Mrs. Anderson about how long you guys need to actually continue like reporting, because school is over on June 10th, and usually like seniors are kind of wrapped up. Yeah, because the big thing that you guys are getting ready for is IB exams, and those the dates on those haven't changed. But since school started like three weeks later, school is going to end officially three weeks later, which is good for all the other grade levels, but for you guys, I don't, anyway, I'll let you work that out. But as Jackson has uh, aptly noted, after May 5th in here, I'm not going to continue piling things on for you. Okay? But I will continue piling things on for you, like, right now. Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that okay, Libby? So we got, we got just... January, February, March, April, really four months, because your IB history exam is May 4th and May 5th. And the other ones are mostly after that. So, all right, questions, comments, concerns. We'll get started on this unit today. We'll continue, so I'm going to be recording today. We'll be recording tomorrow. We do have some, like, in-class video with, like, the rest of episode what was that, 18, backyard. But we're going to talk about some really wild stuff that took place in Nicaragua. Are you ready? Nicaragua. What language do they speak in Nicaragua? Don't say Nicaraguan. <laughs> yeah, I've actually got some people, they, the, uh, one of my former students brought me back this postcard from Nicaragua. And where is it? Where is it? Oh. I had it hanging up. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, here it is. This one, F-S-L-N. You're going to be, like, finding out about the F-S-L-N. It's just a little key ring, but what is it? 
FSS, FSLN. This is a key ring for the Sandinistas. And who are the Sandinistas? And you're like, well, it's the Cold War. They're either good or bad with respect to the United States of America. Are they the good guys or the bad guys? In America, for the Cold War, we are considering them the bad guys. Although he's wearing a white hat, so I mean, I don't know, that's a little confusing. The bad guys. It's like, what is the color red? Is that good during the Cold War or bad? Yeah. It's the color of communism. Yeah. Right, but today, what do we associate with the color red? Yeah. Politics, yeah, the Republican Party, yeah. So it's like, you know, whatever, yeah. I mean, it's like, whatever. So, let's get into the details here. Um, in your notes, um, just to give you a sense of direction at where we're looking, um, the bottom third of page one. Bottom third of page one. This is the Nicaraguan Revolutionary War in the late 70s. We're going to talk about the stuff that occurred before then. And then we'll overlap and get into the Civil War, which took place in the 1980s. Okay, so we've got two parts of Nicaragua. And, um, yeah, it's going to be a very important part with consideration of the Cold, Cold War. Because Carter's going to have one view of what was going on, President Carter. Reagan's going to have a very different view of what was going down in Nicaragua. Are you ready? See, si, they say. See. Si. Let us get to it. Cold War. Nicaragua. Nicar you know where Nicaragua is? You have no idea? Really? It, what, what continent is it in? Not South America. That would be a second good guess, but the best guess is... Yeah, it's North America. It's in the Central American part. Because we're actually going to be talking about quite a few of these countries as we go through this section here. We've got Mexico, right? So if you've got Mexico, right, that's the big one in Central America. Uh, we don't really talk much about Belize, the former British Honduras. We will be talking about Guatemala. Okay, Guatemala. Um, in fact, just write this down. Guatemala. You can <laughs> try and spell it as best as you can. Guatemala. We talked about that before. Um, does that a government that uh, we were supporting, like uh, a friendly, although right-wing, mm, dictatorship, um, in that region? Yes. yes. So we've got a friendly, albeit right-wing, mm, dictatorship government in Guatemala. Um, if you continue on, then you, it, Guatemala borders Honduras and El Salvador. Honduras is bigger. That's on the, the coast of the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And then El Salvador is on the Pacific. Both of those we'll spend some time talking a little bit about as well, particularly El Salvador. Both of them, you can write this down, El Salvador and Honduras, they will also have right-wing governments, friendly to the United States and mm, at times a bit dictatorial. So we're going to see some stuff going down there that's like, really? Those are our friends and allies? Wow. <laughs> and then, south of Honduras, with, with uh, uh, shoreline on the Pacific as well as the Atlantic is Nicaragua. And that's what we're going to get to here. All right, Nicaragua. That's the one, if you go there today, that's the one where they're building a canal. China is helping to build a canal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To rival what other canal that connects the Pacific? Exactly, Panama. If you continue going south, Costa Rica is actually pretty quiet <laughs> during this time period. It's like, Whoa, Costa Rica, they manage, in fact, if you go to Costa Rica, it's like their military almost is non-existent. It's like, whoa, dude, how do they manage to like get all the, all, all the craziness and stuff? Anyway, Costa Rica, if you continue on south past Costa Rica, then you get to Panama, and if you continue on there, then you're in South America, Colombia, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So what we've got here in Nicaragua, we're going to talk, and we'll break it down, we'll do an analysis as far as like how we do for these wars. Type, nature, and combatants in the war. I'll give you that first, right? And then we'll get into the origins and causes of the war. And we'll get into the nature and so forth of the war. So a quick overview. Are you ready? In Nicaragua, this is going to be um, a mixture of civil war, guerrilla war, um, depending on which particular one we're looking at. Because um, there's like two phases. Let's start with the revolutionary phase, okay? The United States initially will support 
samosa. In fact, you can see by this picture, I always like to look for pictures that give you a sense of like, oh, we support him. Here's Anastasio Samosa with his wife. And who is the president that is greeting him in a friendly kind of a way? That's Nixon, okay? So that would put the time period as what? When was Nixon in office? Yeah, he was elected in 68, so 69, and then he resigned in 1974, okay? So, one thing we know of is going into the 70s, we're on the side of Samosa. He is the leader of Nicaragua, and he has got, <clears throat> like, a right-wing dictatorship, okay? Or is what sometimes people refer to as, like, a banana republic. Sometimes people are like... That's a store in the mall that has clothes of like a Latin American. <laughs> they don't sell bananas. Th th I mean, they, the country sells a lot of bananas, and typically, can you guys identify who typically owns a lot of the land upon which the bananas are grown? American companies, American owned companies like United Fruit Company, which has brands like Chiquita. The Chiquita Banana. Anyway, they got these great commercials and so forth, but. It is fascinating because the United States supports, as part of their economy, banana growing. And we're, if it's a republic, I mean, when we do a pledge to the allegiance of the republic, what does republic mean to you? Freedom, voting, winning, losing, democracy, free speech, dealing with it that way. I actually heard somebody make a comment yesterday about what the heck is going on here in Washington, D.C.? We're not a banana republic, and the, the, the intonation meant those republics, so-called banana republics in Central America, they weren't really like democracy promoting, free speech promoting republics either. Who was in charge of them? People like Somoza, right? And how did they come into power? With force. <laughs> And how do they maintain power? With force. And was the United States okay with that? It, depending on who you're talking to. Nixon was like, yeah, we'd rather have that guy because what's the alternative? Who potentially could be on, uh, in charge of Nicaragua if it's not Somoza, who's a right-wing dictator, but at least friendly? It could be like some terrible Castro kind of guy. I don't know, they just might point nuclear weapons at you and it'll cause all kinds of crazies. And maybe they'll coordinate and they'll attack your high school town. You're like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me, Mr. Hansen? Is this going to be like a Red Dawn scenario? Yes, I've got a clip later on uh, in this part where we talk about the Red Dawn scenario. Oh my goodness. Where teenagers fight off the invading communists from Cuba and Russia, and Nicaragua. What? Uh, after May 5th, what do you think, Jackson? Could we watch r the original Red Dawn? We could, with the Brat Pack and those guys and all so forth. Emilio Estevez and I don't know those guys. Yeah, I mean, you could if you wanted to. I'll show you the, the, the trailer at some point. I've got it queued up today. Maybe we'll get to it. I don't know. But, um, so... We are on the side, write this down, we are on the side of Nicaragua and his right-wing regime. But, and this is an important clarification, Jimmy Carter, when he comes in as president in 1977, he's going to have a very different view. And I hinted at this because this was the one thing, we hadn't covered Jimmy Carter yet, and I had that question on there. Write it down. Jimmy Carter is much more about human rights than presidents before and after him. So make sure you write that down. Jimmy Carter, who will be in there for one term, 1977 and 1981, so he's defeated by Reagan. He's going to be much more like, hey, if you're an ally of ours, you need to do a good job on human rights and democracy and free speech and stuff like that. You got that? I mean, it's not like completely, but it's a lot more expectation. And so, put this down. We'll see, as we get into the uh, Nicaraguan Revolutionary War, Jimmy Carter's going to be like, Samosa, man, I have measured you, and you are not the guy who I want to support, so I'm not going to support you anymore, pal. 
Yeah, defriended him. Yeah. Yeah, he got canceled. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a different thing. And so, I'll, I mean, I'll literally, I think I've got the, the one here. Whoops, I'll jump ahead here to this picture. Yeah, I mean, when we eventually the left-wing leader, we haven't introduced him yet, but the left-wing leader is going to be greeted at the White House after he takes control of Nicaragua. Daniel Ortega is going to be the guy's name. Whoops. Yep, there's Ortega. Oh, wait. <laughs> that's, a little, that's a little concerning. The guy who's going to take power, ultimately, in Nicaragua. <laughs> who, who's, who's his friend? Sure. Let's identify the other side in the Nicaraguan Revolutionary War. And you can see why there were some people in the United States that are like, no, this is not going to stand. <laughs> we cannot have some Castro buddy receiving military aid and so forth in charge of a Central American country. Because the next thing you know, we're going to have Russians and Cubans and the Nicaraguans, and they're going to be invading your town. And who's going to defend your town? The Wolverines, the high school students, are going to go up into the, into, into the foothills and the mountains and wage guerrilla war to defend democracy. Makes for a great movie. I think the re redo one, the enemy was like North Korea or something like that. Anyway. So who's going to be on the other side? The Sandinistas. All right? The Sandinistas. And I'm going to have to back up a little bit to talk about where the heck did the Sandinistas come? Because their name comes from some guy that, was, that had been dead since the 1930s, which is really weird. The Sandinistas, on the other side of the uh, Nicaraguan Revolutionary War, are left-wing. Their initials, I mean, their official uh, title is Sandinista National Liberation Front. You see that in there? So FSLN. They're left-wing. And they're supported by the Soviet Union, and in particular, by Cuba. And who is the leader of the Sandinistas? Daniel Ortega. Okay? So we've got all those names. Didn't I, did I put, not put those names in there? Oh, sorry. My bad. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Make sure you get them off of the screen. Yeah, I don't have too, too many names for you to get, but I've got all the names that I need for you to have in this. So, who is, uh, who's our friend McKinley uh, at the beginning of this uh, conflict? Somoza. Okay, good. And who would be on the other side? Ortega. And who is he getting support from? Castro and Soviets. Okay, all right. Well, when he wins, because the, the Revolutionary War, if you look at this, the Revolutionary War is going to be over by 1979. He will win, and he's going to come to the White House. He's going to be invited to the White House by President Carter. But I'll give you a little bit of an insight. When we get to the Civil War part, which is going to take place in the 1980s, President Reagan is going to be like, <clears throat> I don't like this Ortega guy. He is like all communist. And I'm going to support people who are going to try to overthrow them. When we get to the, the uh, Civil War part, we're going to be talking about a group called the Contras. Hold off on that for a moment. I don't want to throw too much at you. But the Contras are going to be a guerrilla movement that will be supported by, I don't know, 53 cents a day will support a Nicaraguan freedom fighter. You can <laughs> mail your money to this address. Vaya con Dios. You can support an anti-communist Contra. I don't know, we're going to send money to them too? Reagan's going to be like, yeah, we should send some money. And well, the Congress is going to be like, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't. Boland Amendment, we'll get to that later. <laughs> I'll be like, where are we going to get some of our money? <laughs> it's not like we're actually going to like, give money to Iran to return hostages that they're holding and then funnel that money into helping the Contras. <laughs> that sounds crazy. Yeah. That's actually going to happen. It's called the Iran-Contra scandal. And when that stuff hits the fan, it's like, what? We did what? I thought we weren't supposed to give money to hostage takers, especially from Iran. Oh, my gosh, those guys are terrible. We'll get to that later. Because you know what Iran does to us in the 70s? They take over our embassy in Iran. And all the like, U.S. personnel that are working in the embassy there, they're taken hostage. 
for 444 days. This was part of my high school experience, like watching television is like, day 350 of the Iran hostage crisis. It's a mess. So yeah, we're not fans. When I was your age, we were not fans of Iran. What are we today? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. No. I mean, yeah. yeah, there's still some tension. I mean, there's some stuff in the news about Iran. It's like, we're going to hit the Capitol building with some, like, bomb or something. Like, what? We've got enough problems of our own without Iran jumping in and just talking about flying planes in. In retaliation, because we took a hit on one of their generals who was involved in terrorism against U.S. forces in the Middle East. Anyway, we've got a lot more stuff coming at you that's going to give you a little bit of context of this crazy world we live in. And why different, different parts of the world, it's like, are they a friend? Should we be concerned about them? Should I go on holiday after I finish high school to Iran? Maybe Afghanistan. There's some lovely mountains up there. I really want to go trekking. Maybe mountain biking. And yeah. I mean, but is this a good time in history for a Westerner from the United States to just go gallivanting off in different parts of the world? It's important to understand history and context before you make those potentially life-altering decisions. Yeah, or like ending, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, if you cover that, it's like three, I mean, literally, I'll read stories about three hitchhikers, three hikers, you know, professional hikers, were captured and beheaded by an extremist Islamic group um, in the mountains off of, I don't know, Afghanistan or Pakistan or who knows where. If you're lucky, they'll just hold you hostage so that money will be handed over to help their military effort. Oy, oy, oy. All right, let's back it up to, let's start it out with Samosa. All right, origins and causes of the war. You ready? Long-term causes. Long-term causes. Let me see, what is a long-term relationship the United States has with Latin American countries even before the Cold War? Well, we have business interests there, and we like for the governments to be helpful to our U.S. business interests. So what would be two words that a U.S. business would really hate if some Latin American government was like, hey, I think we're going to institute this? Very good. You guys are totally on top of this, right? We, or I should say, U.S. businesses who own land in countries like Nicaragua and so forth, they make profit off of the growing of you know, bananas and other kinds of things for export to other parts of the world, including the United States. So our U.S. businesses don't like it when local politicians take the land and hand it over to the local people. Do you understand that? So who would be in favor of taking the land and handing it over to the local people? A lot of the local people, especially the peasants, okay? The landless peasants, especially. Well, there was a fight. Write this down. There was a fight um, in 1927 to 1933 in Nicaragua, 1927 to 1933. This was a guerrilla war that was taking place. Um, basically trying to gain power of Nicaragua and then institute plans like land reform. So think of it as almost like, remember like the Mexican Revolution? And some of the goals of the Mexican Revolution were land reform, and did they eventually get that? Yeah. 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 So that's one of the goals of the guerrilla war. And one of the key leaders, here we go, write this down. One of the key leaders of that revolutionary movement in the late 20s and 30s in Nicaragua was this general, do you see his name? Write his name down. General Augustino, August, excuse me, Augusto Cesar Sandino. It, it, call it a guerrilla war. I mean, we're not going to give it an official name, but call it like a guerrilla war, a peasant-based, you can even call it sort of left-based guerrilla war. Okay? Um, and it will fail. And this guy is ultimately going to be captured, and he's dead, executed in 1934. All right? So you're like, why are we going all the way back to that time? Well, a couple things. Because you have, in the sense as far as like poor peasants, 
unresolved issues. They're not happy with how it turned out. Who was their hero? This guy. And he was killed in 1934. The reason I bring that up is because sometimes when people are trying to put together causes today, they look back in history for important people or events to tap into and say, we're for what these people were for or this guy was for. Do you understand that? So later, you ready? In the 1960s, in fact, officially 1961, there will be a group formed of students and peasants. And let me see, 1961, oh, and Cuba will support it. And what is the name of the group? The Sandinista National Liberation Front, the FSLN. And who they name their group after? This guy, yeah. So it's almost like, I remember when um, Barack Obama was first elected, and he had these various different policies that he wanted to get implemented, like Obamacare and so forth. And there was different people who were like, oh, we're very much against it. And they took as their name, anybody know this? They took as their name an event that was important in the American Revolutionary period. They know? It was when people in Boston got really upset at the British about like trying to collect taxes on imported tea. The Tea Party movement, yeah, the Tea Party movement is like a, you know, protest movement. And so they, the, the, the Tea Partiers, I don't know if there's that many people so-called Tea Partiers today, but, you know, it wasn't that long ago, 2009, 2010, the Tea Party movement was like an anti, you know, uh, it was a protest movement against the policies of Barack Obama and Obamacare and so forth, yeah. Yeah, it's the Sandinista National Liberation Front, also known as the Sandinistas. Here we go. F-S-L-N, Sandino, okay? All right, now, we got that. That's going to be developing in the 1960s, but let's back it up a little bit. Which, um, if you go back to the 1930s, you'll also see the beginning of a power uh, group, and that is the Samosa family. Write it down. The Samosa family. The Samosas gain power officially in 1936, okay? And they're basically going to pass it down. It's sort of like hereditary. So you think of like um, in North Korea, that passes down from grandfather to father to son, and who knows, maybe over to sister. Who knows how that's going to shake out. But it's within the family. So the Samosa family is the all-powerful political family in Nicaragua and it's passed down from father to son. And where is it by the 1970s? This guy has it, Anastasio Somoza. And he's gonna be the last Somoza that's gonna have political power in Nicaragua. Because it's, it's gonna be lost uh, while he is in charge, okay? How does the United States feel about the Somoza family? What do you think, Frank? Is the United States gonna be supportive of the Somoza family in uh, power in Nicaragua? as we go into the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, particularly in the Cold War? Yeah. Why yes? Write it down. Why yes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Why would we be supportive? And this is the weird thing. Why would we be supportive of some political family that's in charge of a country where they don't really allow for, like, free elections and stuff? Why would we <laughs> support them? What matters to us more than anything during the Cold War? Well, let's put it this way. Are you going to get pictures of Samosa all chummy and friendly with Castro? No. Who's Samosa? What does he think of Castro? He hates him. So he's on our side. That's the key thing. I want you to write that down. The Samosa family, they're smart. They know if they want to continue getting support, and do, write this down, they get military support, financial support from the United States of America. Now, Kennedy, during the Alliance for Progress, he'd be like, I don't know, you guys need to do a little bit better. But ultimately, we're like, they're anti-communist. And in the 1960s and 70s, they're anti-Castro, they're anti-Cuban, and so they're on our side. You got that? I mean, who's going to be the only president that's going to go, 
That's not good enough. You need to be for democracy. Livy, who's going to be the president in the United States that will go, that's not good enough? It's not Nixon. No, Nixon's still chummy with him here. And it's not going to be Ford, who comes after Nixon, resigns. It's going to be? Who is a president that's sort of like, you know what? Human rights matter. The big JC, yeah. His initials are JC, but he might not be that JC. I don't think he's that JC. But Jimmy Carter, yeah? Okay? Yeah. Yeah, so Jimmy Carter will be like, yeah, come on, Samosa, you need to do a better job here. Um, so here's how it ultimately plays out. You ready? Here's a short-term cause. The Sandinistas, operating in the name of this man who had been dead for like, what, 30-some-odd years, the Sandinistas start organizing in the 1960s with the help of the uh, Cubans and ostensibly with some help uh, from the, so the Soviets. Although if you ask Castro, whose idea was it to help the Sandinistas in Nicaragua? It's my idea. And the Soviets sort of go along with it, whatever, whatever. Okay? Um, in the 1970s, the Sandinistas really start ramping it up. Let me talk about some of the uh, methods. It's kind of weird because it's like the Revolutionary War starts in 1976. No, revolutionary activities are taking place throughout the 1970s. Let's look at some of the things that take place that are part of the Sandinistas' efforts. Write this down. Kidnapping. 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 No, not napping. Kidnapping. Well, they're like, oh, kids napping. A bunch of kids in a room taking a nice little rest. Isn't that your favorite time when you babysit? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, they're so nice. And then they wake up and they're like, ah, you know, let's have fun. All right, so kidnapping. Why would a group that is trying to gain power kidnap a bunch of people? What do they want? Money, yeah. So here's the deal. They kidnap people. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, actually, it peaked in uh, August of 1978. In August of 1978, there were 2,000 hostages that were taken that yielded, I don't know, would you pay, Julian, if you were kidnapped and a ransom note was sent to your family, would they pay? I don't know. $5, would they pay? Yeah, they'd pay $5. $50. Yeah. $500. I don't know, it's more cheap. <laughs> okay, there you go. So what kind of people do you suppose are, are likely to get kidnapped? 22,000, yeah. People that had, like, some value. That's why it's very dangerous for Americans to go abroad to places that are in turmoil. Because you could get kidnapped or killed. But if you get kidnapped, they're going to hang on to you, anticipating that, oh, all those Americans are rich. I mean, they're rich enough to send you to go backpacking into some wilderness area. They're going to make some money off of it. Apparently, uh, up, upwards of about, like, um, $500,000 ransom coming in. So there's a fair amount of ransom money that comes in. <laughs> I mean, if you look at these military insurrection efforts and so forth, they're like, how do we get the money? Sometimes you get the money enough that you need from whatever, the United States or the Soviet Union. Sometimes you have to, like, improvise. See if you can figure this out. Raise your hand if you can tell me. I don't know if it's necessarily for Sandinistas, but raise your hand if you can tell me what is another fundraising method that a, a group might do. It has to do with agriculture. Drugs. Grow drugs. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to pause right there. But yeah, we'll see like uh, cocaine and heroin are going to be definitely fundraising efforts used by military groups. All right. We'll pick it up more next time.